How's everyone doing? So, Strength Chat episode 51, and today I have got a very special guest for you. Today I am joined by Dr. Mike Israetel, the co founder and chief sports scientist of Renaissance Periodization. How are you doing? I'm doing really well. Thanks for having me on. No worries at all. Um, what have you been up to? What's been going on? Oh, man, you know, uh, the same old. I've been training a lot. Uh, and I'm actually about to start a diet in a couple of days to get me pretty lean. And uh, at work, things are good. We just published the Renaissance Diet 2.0 book. And in addition to that, we just released a diet app, uh, such as really cool. Um, I, I built most of that, or I designed most of it. And uh, we're working on a couple other big projects. So busy, busy time, uh, all as well. Good. Uh, enough to keep you out of trouble. <laughs> I guess, yeah. <laughs> um, so for anyone listening who might not know your background or how you got to the position that you're in now, um, just want to give a little bit of a background to yourself, how you started out in the um, industry, if you like, and how you got to the position um, of where you are now. Sure. So I, uh, my introduction to physical culture was really kind of like wrestling in high school. Uh, which we do some of in the United States. There's high school wrestling. And uh, then by the time that I went to college, I had already begun lifting weights to get stronger at wrestling, and I started to fall in love with lifting weights. So I started powerlifting competitively in, in university, and then I did a master's program uh, in exercise science to just try to learn more stuff. And then after that, I actually went to go – uh, and work for a year in New York City being a personal trainer. And that was a really cool experience. Lots of super, super smart, super wealthy people over there take on uh, personal trainers. And my uh, friend from university, Nick Shaw, and I, we worked there together as trainers. And then we sort of started to talk about maybe going into business together eventually. And we saw a whole lot of uh, just bunk, just really crap pseudoscience going around. And uh, it really uh, upset us, I guess, to some extent, and we wanted to make a change for the better. And then I started a PhD program in uh, sports science, okay. and I started focusing more on bodybuilding myself. And then Nick and I started Renaissance Periodization because we were co coaching clients, and we just had to have a way of sort of unifying the business between the two of us. And, um, you know, then I was a professor for uh, two years in Missouri, state of Missouri in the United States. Then... I was a professor in Pennsylvania for two years, and as this entire time was going on, I started training in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. I've been training that for five years now, still uh, training in bodybuilding. I compete occasionally, and um, Renaissance periodization has been growing this entire time. I started by writing articles and just training people, then eventually I wrote enough articles to where I got tired of explaining to people why we do things the way we do for diet. You know, clients say, why am I doing this and not keto or something? So uh, we wrote our first book, The Renaissance Diet, in response to that, and it went really well. Um, started working with Chad Wesley Smith, writing books and articles, and then wrote Scientific Principles of Strength Training. That went super well. And then we uh, sort of, from the way the book had laid out a sequence of dieting that you should follow, we designed the diet templates at Renaissance, which are sort of auto-followable diets. Those are super successful. And then I can say this now. Uh, the idea, my idea for the app, the diet app actually came before the templates, but I told Nick, I said, hey, you know, we can shortcut the app and make this uh, sort of PDF Excel spreadsheet version first. And he's like, all right, we'll try it. And then it took so long for us to get the app going that this, this entire time, three years now, I think more or less, we've been sort of working on the app. Finally, it's out. So, uh, and we have all kinds of other products or kinds of other books, training products. We have the male and female physique templates, powerlifting stuff. So it's turned into a little a company here, not no longer mom and pop size. <laughs> and, um, uh, you know, I used to be a professor for a while. And last year I quit being a professor because it was so much work to do at RP that I had to do an RP full time. So now I, um, I stay at home all day long when I'm not training. And uh, I, my neighbors probably think my wife works and I don't, which is hilarious. <laughs> uh, so that's where I'm at. Oh, okay. Uh, I must admit the uh, Renaissance Periodization um, Diet and the um, Principles of Strength Training book, they're two books that I still refer to um, as, as a coach myself and have been um, really, really handy. Um, I also saw the um, Boris Shako book that you wrote, the 
Um, you wrote a little bit in there as well, which um, I'm, that's one of my uh, to-do lists is to is to read that uh, and get that get that sorted this year. Um, which is um, yeah, which I'll find I'll find really interesting. Um, yeah, that's a, that took us a, so. Unfortunately, the translation for that book was what was taking a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, we had some translators that would just sort of come and go, and the project would get dropped and picked up, dropped and picked up. I must have mentioned it two years ago or something, and I didn't see any work for a long time. But then finally, we got all the chapters together. Myself and Derek Wilcox, a powerlifter coach at Renaissance, we wrapped it up super quick and got it out. And then now people seem to like the book a whole lot. So Shaco Powerlifting Manual, it's also available on RP, and it's the first time a full book of Shakos has been translated. And I don't want to like um, uh, give people too much of a lead here, but there are plans in the works to translate more Russian books um, and get them to an English speaking audience. Uh, yeah. Is there, I suppose a lot of that content out there um, hasn't really been made ready available to um, sort of, like you say, English, English speaking, if you like, I'm sure there'll be loads and loads of um, content out there. There's tons, so we just have to pick what we think people will like the most and go with it. Um, there's talk about, so Shaco has a bench press manual, a bench press book. Um, that's probably going to be something pretty interesting to people, and that might be maybe something we'll do relatively soon in the next year. Ah, cool. Was the goal to always um, go into um, professing um, and working in universities, or was that just um, enjoying studying and wanting to learn a little bit more uh, and help coach other people as well? Well, so the, um, after getting a PhD, there's a bunch of things you could potentially do, but one of them is being a university professor. And during my master's program, and especially during my PhD, I, I started lecturing a lot, and I started doing a lot of teaching in classes as well as giving lectures outside of class to various organizations usually for free and I got to be pretty decent at it and I really liked it I thought I had pretty decent uh, abilities to instruct people so then uh, being a professor was actually a really fun job so it was my first real serious job um, after graduate school and uh, I liked it uh, and I still like it I would have never left being a professor had uh, RP not gotten so big so um, I don't can't say I always wanted to be a professor I was that's an interesting desire. So someone, you know, like a five-year-old, like, I want to be a firefighter. I want to be a police <laughs> officer. I want to be a professor. What the hell's wrong with you, kid? Yeah. But, um, you know, ever since I started to really get deeper into my PhD and figure out that I really liked teaching and people told me I was okay at it, um, I thought, hey, I can, I can keep doing this. And I, I really, I do have a passion for spreading uh, what I consider to be more accurate information than, than otherwise. I will say that uh, I do have the opposite of a passion I suppose hatred is the opposite of a passion, right? A passionate <laughs> hatred for uh, pseudoscience and, and BS and misunderstandings. Um, it's just a uh, really, you know, um, it's just, it's just, uh, it, you know, there's so much in this world that is truly mysterious um, that it, it, it's going to take a population you know, a hundred billion more people on earth or a combination of people and machines to even begin to understand a lot of these things that are so mysterious. And, and because there's so much work to be done, it's really just baffling when people take things of which we know stuff about already and just make up BS to lie to people, yeah. you know, like it's almost like having a, a group of commandos and they're in enemy territory and, you know, like there's 10 guys and it's like, Hey, what do we know about the enemy? And the guys are like, not much. Like, okay, well, let's go split up and scope around and see what's going on. And one of them comes back and he just lies to you. He's like, yeah, there's no mines over there. And the first guy to step on it blows up. And like, Why the hell would you do that? <laughs> you don't know where the other real enemies are. Why are you making stuff up? So yeah. part of being a professor was so cool about it is I got to actually uh, give um, students the tools for which, the knowledge and the tools for which to kind of have a BS detector. Right, so if they see some stuff that's BS, they're like, mm, yeah, that doesn't sound right, and then they look it up, and it turns out it's wrong. There's a lot of people, especially as you well know, you train clients, people come in to your practice and, and say, I want to do that. I want to look like this. And you're like, okay, well, here's how it's going to be. And they're like, I heard it's going to be like twice as easy, and I just can target my glutes, and that's it. And, and you just have to painfully open them up to the reality of stuff. So cool thing about being a public educator to some extent is I can make potentially your job a little bit easier so that people entering the space are like, okay, I know it's calorie restriction and weight training. Let's just start. Instead of you having to be like, okay, see this poster ball, we're going to throw it out. And they're like, but that's my friend. I like the ball. 
Yeah, I, mu I must admit that a lot of the content that you've put out there has really helped me develop as a coach. Um, what I ask about the um, about being a being a professor is that I sort of fell in um, to being a being a coach. Uh, I went, I, I did sport and exercise science at university, and uh, went and did um, uh, a year in uh, Australia. Came back, worked as a tree surgeon a little bit. Saw someone was opening a gym and sort of fell into that because I, I enjoyed training. Um, and then, you know, looking at coaches like yourself, trying to read the topics and every, everything that you put out there, there's a reason behind it. It's not just, yeah, let's do this because, I don't know, it looks, looks, looks fun. Let's, let's, let's do that. I can't and, even imagine doing that. <laughs> yeah. What I quite liked is, um, I think he did a talk on uh, stronger experts or, or, or strong experts. And it was about, um, you, you worded it really well. It was sort of, um, as a coach, do you want to be their best friend or do you want me to be, um, right, this is how, how it's going to get there. Uh, and it's sort of, right, we'll start at this point and then we'll, then we'll work it through. Um, and I think it's just, as, as when, if you're coaching clients and athletes, it lets them know, look, this is what is expected of you. We can do it this way or you know, we can have a little bit, a little bit of fun with it to get, to, to get the results that they need. It's funny, I just read a Facebook conversation uh, pertinent to this. Somebody had linked the infographic that uh, Jacob Skepis made off of that, that discussion and uh, tagged in it. And uh, there's a discussion under that where one guy is like, well, yeah, but I still think that, you know, you still need to have fun in training. And then, which I agree with, so it's fine, it's fine, it's a fine statement. You just have to know where you where the trade-off is. Like, yeah. Um, and one person was like, started saying, he's like, well, you know, I try to learn about all of my athletes to figure out what they think is fun and then sort of deliver that. It took me everything not to respond and be like, motherfucker, what do you mean by athletes? You mean clients? You're an athlete. You've got a fucking football match at uni in a couple of weeks. You don't have a choice. Do you want to win or not? You know, like, yeah. fun. can you imagine like losing a fucking football match by like, you know, one point in overtime and the coach is like, well, fellas, but at least we had a lot of fun and training. And they're like, yeah, you know, it's really the fun and training that counts. Are you fucking kidding me? So yeah. it's, just, it's just hilarious even in that perspective. I think maybe what I'm saying is some people call their clients athletes where it's just not entirely correct. Mm -hmm. Because with athletes, that spectrum that I described is a lot shorter, right? There's, there's the fuckery fun side. It's just not as long. You've got to get real close to pretty soon. You know, with regular clients, you can start them off a little easier, a little bit more fun, and then slowly develop their culture. Now, honestly, I, I, know, I was wondering what you think about this. When you're an athlete, a competitive athlete, and you're like, oh, coach, this isn't fun, I mean, wh why would you even say something like that out loud? You know what I mean? Uh, having, um, because having done a, a sport and exercise um, a science degree, uh, I wanted to basically challenge myself and go into a sporting environment and see, see what, what, was that, what was that like, as opposed to, you know, you have your, you have your clients coming in, your general population, and you might see them, you know, three, three times a week and you can take your time over months or whatever it might be. And mainly it was with, uh, with rugby and uh, came in and uh, the coach was like, right, you've got, uh, you've got an hour in the gym and then I want them out on, on the field. So it's a little bit, right, you've, you've got to get the work done in, yeah. in that hour. It's not a case of, yeah, let, let's, let's experiment with this. Let's, let's uh, sure. do a little bit of foam rolling and have a little bit of a laugh. It's like... Why haven't? Because if not, the coach will come in and just say, "Why? Why aren't my players get? Why are they tired on the field? Why aren't they strong enough? Why are they getting battered um, on yeah. on the field?" And um, so that when you when I saw that, I thought that was I thought you put it really well. I, I, enjoy, I yeah, I liked how you put that across. Thank you. So on uh, obviously the work that you've done with uh, Renaissance periodization and uh, Juggernaut training systems. You've put quite a lot of stuff out there uh, for training for hypertrophy. A lot of the clients that are um, coming to me are wanting to get a little bit bigger and a little bit stronger. So uh, you've put into you put articles up of uh, training the different body parts uh, and that sort of stuff. What is your uh, putting it all into um, one big um, uh, format, if you like? What is your recommended uh, training each area? Um, and what splits do you usually uh, sort of recommend that has the uh, the biggest effect, if you like? Can you restate the first part of the question? So, from the uh, from the articles on hypertrophy that you were, that you were putting out, 
if someone was to put a program on there being like, right, this is hypertrophy for your glutes, hypertrophy for your back, how would that sit into sit into a program? How would that come into um, sort of a workout as opposed to just in the body parts? Sure. Well, you know, so I think the place to begin is a needs analysis, like my colleague, Dr. James Hoffman, would always say, um, is you have to find out what it is that you're in for in the gym. You know, there's people like uh, in, in the United States, we play American football, and a lot of people do like things like power cleans and hand cleans in American football, and then they get to, uh, to university, and they don't play football anymore because they're, you know, just uh, students at that point, and they go into the weight room, and they are clearly training with the exclusive goal of trying to look good naked so they can bang more. Like, it's just, duh. Right? <laughs> That's what they'll tell you, too. But then they'll, like, do power cleans and hang cleans. You say, why are you doing that? And they're like, isn't that good for, like, overall development or athleticism? And I was like, are you still interested in athleticism? And they're like, I guess not. So a lot of people just train them on momentum, and they just think there's these exercises you're supposed to do or movements or body parts that, like, well, you're just supposed to do them. So the first thing is just picking out all the muscle groups you want to develop, whether it be strengthen, row, or both, and making a list of those, right? And there's, that's it. And then, then you design a program based on those. How would you design a program based on those? Well, you have to consider a, a just pretty much two things. One, am I training a body part? In my, is my split designed to train the body part frequently enough? So, like, is, uh, you know, Training once a week, fine, yeah, especially if beginners will get pretty good results off of that. More advanced people might get good results off of that. Everyone in the middle will probably not get such great results. Um, so maybe, you know, two to four sessions a week is a good start, making sure you hit that body part. So as you make your program, make sure, you know, every, like, your chest is trained two to four times a week, arms two to four times, so on and so forth. And then the second consideration is interference. Like, is training one body part uh, going to interfere with training others? For example. Let's say you put grip work, right, uh, before your back work. Yeah. Uh, you know, if you don't have straps uh, at least or chalk at the very least, it's just not going to be a very effective way to train because your limiting factor is going to be a grip and you're not going to train your back much at all. Uh, and uh, another kind of interference is interference when your sessions are too close together. So let's say you, someone told you you need to train chest four times a week. You say, okay. Um, or let's say you let make an easy example, three times a week. You say, okay, great. I'm going to train chest Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Okay. It's a fine idea. The problem is, you know, Monday's workout uh, is going to be great. Tuesday's workout is going to be a little bit more likely that you're going to get hurt because you've damaged the muscle fibers and connective tissues already and you're training hard again. And if you answer, well, I'm not going to train them as hard that day, then you're intentionally training them easier than they should be because they're insufficient to heal which can work for a functional overreaching effect two sessions back-to-back. -back. If you have three sessions back-to-back, -back, that last session is super, super underloaded, and it's a, you know, or it's high risk, so you pick one or the other, and then you have like way too long of a time to heal from all that stuff, and you're not growing muscle nearly as efficiently as you could be. So basically what you want to do is pick your body parts you want to train, spread them relatively evenly throughout the week, like chest, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, sweet, um, and then you make sure they don't interfere with each other or cause any problems. And in addition to that, you're going to consider like, okay, per given workout, uh, if I do too many exercises or just too much work, I get tired towards the end. And that end of the workout is just not super efficient anymore. So maybe I can switch it to another day. So for example, you can do uh, chest, back, and legs uh, on Monday and Thursday. Okay, fine. Or you can train, uh, you know, chest and, uh, uh, you know, or upper body, a bit of chest, a bit of back Monday and Thursday. And you can train legs a, a bit Tuesday and Friday. Like, that's probably a better way to do it because you're splitting up the volume and thus not causing a lot of fatigue. So if you have a workout that trains the muscle groups um, frequently enough, relatively symmetrically, so there's a, an SRA paradigm, which you'll recognize from scientific principles, your session or recover, adapt, and then another session, right? Not just back-to-back -back sessions for no reason. And then if you work that in to a way that in each workout, the training doesn't interfere with itself, and then workout to workout, it doesn't interfere with itself too much, then you've got a functional plan. And, and that's kind of a checklist you can go through. And somebody could be sitting, listening to this, and thinking, damn, that's like really technical analysis, and it's just principles-based. What about like 
um, upper lower? What about like push pull? Well, depending on your constraints and goals, a bunch of systems work really well as long as they check those check marks. Like, are you getting enough frequency? Is there enough recovery between muscle group days? Are your workouts constructed such a way that you have plenty of energy and can efficiently finish them and work out to work out to work out? Are there any sort of interference effects? Let me give you another example. If you do heavy bent rows and deadlifts the day before your squat emphasis quad workout, your lower and upper back might actually limit your squat performance so that your quads kind of get fucked over. If you split the other two differently or if you took a day apart and rested, I might be better off. So a lot of program design, I can tell you when I look at programs designed by people who it's the first or second time writing a program, I'm like, okay, why the fuck would you ever do that? And they're like, I don't know, it looks good. And you're like, okay, it doesn't, it doesn't never work in real life because you'll be too tired. Um, and, uh, I remember looking at a workout when I was a professor, a student of mine wrote a workout. It was a five exercise back workout. And it was designed for uh, people who weigh about um, 110 to 130 kilos bear with me. And each one was five sets of roughly 12 reps. Okay. And the last exercise was five by 12 pull-ups. <laughs> now, I don't know about you. But I can't do five by 12 pull-ups. <laughs> and even if that's fresh now, after four exercises of five by 12, holy <laughs> shit. Right? And it looks fine on paper, but it just never worked in real life. A lot of the stuff you can, you know, just following the technical analysis I've just described, you can totally just learn right, just with no experience. But some of the intricacies of that, like what exactly is interference? Is this an example of interference? It just has to come from just lots of experience on yourself with clients. That's why a coach who's been coaching for five years, 10 years is probably better, probably not always, than someone who's been coaching for one or two, because one or two, you're just going to make sort of junior league mistakes. So that's basically how you design programs. And then it can be push-pull, a split. It can be every day, whole body. It can be upper-lower. A lot of that's just how fast are people recovering. If you train, you know, uh, uh, females in their, you know, 30s and 40s who don't have a lot of muscle mass, after a couple of months of training, they recover super fast. So you can train them, like, basically whole body every day. It's usually fine. You might bias it a little bit more, a little less. Um, and then, you know, people who take, you know, week, days and days to recover may, may do like a two-a-day body part split or even once a week, one and a half times a week where you train chest really hard Monday and Thursday make just a, a little bit of chest or Friday, something like that. But it's all based on the demands, the constraints, and those basically the foundational approaches. Yeah. That's um, – it's funny how you say about writing programs at the start after being a coach, one or, one or two years of coaching. I remember putting programs like that being yeah yeah it looks really good and then people will come in and just be um I'm, I'm, I'm yeah i can't i can't do it i'm i'm, I'm wiped out um with the uh, systemizing the uh, the using that system for for programming um especially from the uh, scientific principles scientific principles book it's it's just training a little bit smarter it's not a case of yeah i'm just gonna just throw everything out there and see what i can do a lot um Oh, before Christmas, I had, a, I had a guy come in for a program uh, and he was like, I'm looking for a little bit of advice with, with training. Okay, show me what, you, show me what you're currently doing. Um, the, uh, put, uh, the squat day, if you like, and the deadlift day, really, really short, not, not much on there. Um, okay, so that, that doesn't look too much, like you've got all the big exercises in there. Looked at the upper body day, it was so, so long. Ah, well, why, why, why is it so long? Oh, well, I really like doing up, upper body. Do you have to do every single upper body exercise in, in, one, in one workout? You know, maybe, maybe spread it out a little bit. Um, so, yeah, I think that is a, it is a good system to use. And it's the more I've learned about uh, and developed as a coach and learned about programming, that's definitely a system that, like you say, you know, it, it works and it, it's training a little bit smarter. What are your, what are your thoughts on... Um, training to failure. So I know you mentioned about having longer workouts and it might be um, form might be dropping off at the end. Is that a difference between working to fail, training to failure in sets? And is there a time where you would ever do that? Yeah, it's a good question. So we have a little bit of research on what constitutes training too far away from failure. It's not super rock solid yet, but it seems like there's a big efficiency gain or a rather a stimulus to fatigue ratio gain if you train five reps in reserve or less. Five reps, four reps in reserve, three in reserve, you know, getting closer to failure. In the five reps in reserve or less, 
it seems to be that you can get more stimulus without a crazy amount of fatigue. Whereas if you do six or eight reps in reserve, you end up having to do so many sets of that to get a good stimulus that your fatigue will actually be higher than you thought it would. Um, so uh, in, in essence, I think, uh, you know, short of five reps to failure, it, it's, it's at least inefficient by time and possibly even stimulus to fatigue ratio is just lower. Um, so the next thing is uh, what about the top end? And the other question is, you know, is it beneficial to train to failure versus one or two reps away? And is it beneficial to train maybe even beyond failure? And there's actually been quite a few studies on this. And what they really show is after you get about two reps away from failure, there's not a huge difference between two reps and one rep away from failure. And there's not a huge difference between two reps, one rep, and zero reps, so basically going to failure. So uh, especially in the medium term, as best as we can tell, it just doesn't there's no compelling reason to go to failure um, because uh, it probably is a little bit more effective for hypertrophy to go to true failure versus two reps in reserve. But then we have to ask them that second question of the stimulus to fatigue ratio. And now this really comes in uh, super handy. So stimulus to fatigue ratio is basically for any given set of training, you can even do it by rep, but in this case set, mm -hmm. um, can you, how much stimulus are your muscles receiving? How much growth will they, uh, uh, will occur versus how much fatigue are they accumulating, which is going to fuck you up later in your program and end up having a deload early or risk of injury, sort of, and so on and so forth. So it's been shown that training to failure is a little bit better than training two reps shy of failure, one rep shy. So the stimulus is a little bit higher. But we have every reason to believe that the fatigue from failure training is way higher, right? Exponentially higher than the linear increase in, in the stimulus. So basically, if we had a line like this mm -hmm. from five reps in reserve right here all the way to failure right here, that's the stimulus line. The more you do, the better the stimulus gets. And then the fatigue would look like this, <laughs> Right? So, like, you get close to failure. I mean, over here, right, here's your failure point. Your fatigue's here. Whereas if you did two reps to fail, your fatigue might be right here. So the stimulus to fatigue ratio, which is really probably one of the most important concepts in training for hypertrophy and strength as well, is, like, are you getting what you want for a sustainable cost? You know what I mean? Like, if you go to the store and shop for bread, there's really shit bread for, like, where, where are you at uh, in the world? Uh, Leeds in uh, you in England. <laughs> England, okay. So you know, there's like a, a you know a loaf is like a uh, you know a, a loaf of bread is a pound, yeah. right? And and it's like really shit. You know, it's just terrible bread. Look, okay, well, like, like the the cost, the the ratio of bread goodness to cost is just whatever. It's crappy. I'm not even gonna buy. It. Then at the other end of the uh, spectrum, you could have a loaf of bread that costs like 15 pounds. Like, what the fuck? Is it made of gold? <laughs> like, what's going on? I'm not paying that. And then maybe somewhere in between, you have like, you know, a two pounds or three pounds for a, a loaf of bread that even the 15 pound might be artisan and oh, fucking organic. It might taste really good. But that two or three pound loaf of bread might taste pretty fucking good. It's not the 15 pound, but the ratio of two to three pounds for how much bread you get for it is just so much better. So that's what, you know, if you're going to be eating bread every week, you're going to want to buy the middle bread pretty much most of the time, right? Um, so on average, sets of, oh man, you know, around two reps shy of failure, probably where you want to concentrate most of your efforts. Really good stimulus not an excessive amount of fatigue. Um, in addition to that, training to failure, especially with challenging weights and compound movements, is an independent risk for injury fatigue aside. You know, pushing that close to failure, shaking under massive weights, a lot can go wrong. If you stop two reps shy of failure, yeah, things can go wrong, but it's just not nearly as likely. And then you have to ask yourself the next question, but is it really worth it for me to push injury risk that highly if what I'm getting is like just a linear increase? And the injury risk increase is probably exponential as well. So it's like, man, you know, the thing is with injury, you know, just growing a little bit more is cool, but getting hurt is really bad as you've probably got hurt in your career. You can tell, like, 
it takes you away for weeks, if not longer. I mean, there's no, if someone said like, hey, okay, you know, you can get a thousand pounds if you just step in to this little enclosure and there's flies, there's like a dozen flies in there and you just scoop up the money and go. You're like, okay, sweet. And they're like, okay, but we have five more pounds in this little other enclosure where there's bees. You'd be like, what the fuck? <laughs> what? No. And they're like, but it's five pounds. And you're like, no thanks. You know, maybe if it was another thousand pounds, you could go in there with the bees a little bit if you're not allergic, right? But people seem to think that they need to go to failure because there's this, that's where all the growth happens. That's not where all the growth happens. It's a little bit more growth for a lot more negative stuff. Now, yeah. that being said, what is, so that answers the average of going to failure, but there is also a progression to failure. So when you start with a certain number of exercises and weights and, and, and sets and so on and so forth, uh, you start a mesocycle, you could probably get a pretty good benefit because they're new exercises, rep ranges, et cetera, and just getting used to them. You could probably get great benefits from like five reps or four reps away from failure. You know, like if you ever, you remember like, like last time you did a new exercise and you like did like four sets to failure of the first day because you were so excited and you're like, oh my God, my pecs are sore for like a week. You're like, well, that was clearly overkill, right? I could have still gotten a great benefit if I had done way less. So in the first week of training, maybe stick to five reps in reserve, four reps in reserve. And then as you add weight and try to keep your reps stable, your reps in reserve will probably fall. And then how do you know when you're pushing it hard enough? Well, the last week, stop one rep shy of failure. And on some exercises like machine movements and things where their dumbbells aren't going to come crashing into your head and kill you, you can go all the way to failure. And then that should be the last week. So if you do a failure training, honestly, in most cases, not all, most, the next week should be a deload week because it's a, you, you gave a really just the tip of the top stimulus and, and this is you, you, how are you going to do better than that? The fatigue accumulation will prevent you doing better than that. And unless you start to go into forest reps and stuff like that, there's no benefit really quickly just to keep this uh, as informative as we can. What's the argument against forest reps or is there one? There is. It's primarily one of, first of all, the fatigue, the stimulus to fatigue ratio of forest reps is like fucking awful. Right, like you're getting maybe some benefit, but like I don't know if you ever done four straps before. I haven't. No, no. That's for the best. You should try them once just to see how stupid they are. That's when you can't do the weight anymore, and someone helps you with it. Like yeah. you would think, like once you can't do it, you can't do it. But people, there's lots of fuckery out there, and they're trying to get around. I mean, so does it really do a good job of exhausting the musculature and stimulating all the faster twitch fibers? Yeah, it does. And at what expense of fatigue? And here's another independent critique of it. Going beyond failure with assistance, you are no longer able to track your progress and thus present appropriate overload. How much of the weight did your training partner lift? You can't know that sort of thing. You literally just don't know. Yeah. So if someone's like, okay, I'm going to do five reps of bench press on my own and then three with your help, I usually am like, you know, let's just do five. And <laughs> yeah. I'll like that I have an injury. I'll just straight up some, – some days I'm – just straight up tell people like, you know, I'm not going to do four straps. Like, <laughs> or, or what I'll do is I'll do one four strap with them where I barely grab the weight. They feel nice and exhausted and I just rack it for them. <laughs> but when they say like, you know, four ups with your help, if they get me to help them one week and I'm a piece of shit and barely do anything. And if they get someone else to help them another week that helps a lot more and they get six reps, are they going to be like, man, I got more reps this week. That's good. Well, how do you know if it's good? You're not no longer measuring anything. Yeah. You have no control of the strength of the person. So a lot of people want to get into four straps, and here's my sort of final coup de grace argument against, against going beyond failure. People say it really stimulates stuff. We go, sweet, sweet. Why not just do another set of like one to failure? I've never heard a good answer to that, by the way. Some guys will be like, all right, I'm doing two sets of bench, and on the last set, I'll strip the weight, and we'll do this crazy drop set, burnout set, and four straps. I'm like, okay, why don't you just do four sets of bench? And they're like, because uh, there's no good answer to that. It's safer. It's more straightforward, and it gives you all the same benefits. Just doing more sets usually solves a lot of the problems that people are trying to, uh, you know, enhance their injury risk and develop a ton of fatigue. Uh, I'll tell you real quick, another fatigue source of with horse reps and training to failure, especially is psychological fatigue, which adds up. You know, you've walked in the gym before when it's like two or three reps in reserve, and you're like, whatever, I'm just going to do this. It's going to be great. But if every set has to be two failure Dude, two or three sets into that, I mean, it's like a religious struggle. It gets really tough psychologically, and especially regular clients. Athletes might be able to plow away at that for a while, even though they don't have to. Regular clients, day-to-day -day folks, man, that's just gonna give, they're just going to give up. They're going to leave training and never come back. 
because it's needlessly psychologically taxing. And notice I'm not making an argument that says, you know, oh, you need to go psychology, we need to pamper people. No, no, you're going to work as hard as you need to to get the results. But if you don't need to work that hard psychologically, why would you? It doesn't make any sense. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I compete in powerlifting myself, so using the, the RP system because – before that, I'd, I'd never really, never really used it, and just you know, felt as though I was just running against the against the brick wall. Do a right work up to an an, an RPE eight, and all of a sudden, I've you know overestimated a little bit. And when you mentioned about four, four reps, why I laughed is that yeah, sometimes if I if I am struggling with a bench, I might have a little bit of a, <laughs> a hand if I have uh, you know over, overestimated what I'm what I'm lifting. Um, but yeah, I think mental mental fatigue can have a can have an effect in it. And when you're chatting about um, you know what? What's the point of doing that? Going all out in that one session, play the long game. I've had I've had clients come in uh, for the first week of their program, and they'll they'll load it up really really heavy. And my sort of um, comment to them is, in four weeks' time or however long the program is, you're going to have to lift heavier. You want to see some progress on 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 the bar later down the line. So why not? You know, start off on this on at uh, this point. And then you know, gradually, gradually increase it up a little bit, um, rather than like you say, if you get injured, then you know you might be out training for um, three, four weeks, and all the all the muscle mass, all the progress that you've made has just gone out the window because you you wanted to make sure that you gave a hundred percent to that session, as opposed to you know separating out and you know again that that key thing that we I said in, we said in the last time uh, last comment. Just training a little bit smarter. Just thinking about what you're what you're doing a little bit more. Um, yep. It will have a, it will have a carry on effect onto onto the next session. Yep. In terms of when you were chatting about uh, training volume, uh, there was an article that you put out uh, on uh, on Renaissance Periodization. Renaissance Periodization. It's it's a tough, to, tough word. Couple words <laughs> to say. Sorry. <laughs> Need to put uh, my my right teeth in. Um, you chatted about volume. Um, so uh, maintenance volume, uh, maximum effect volume, and uh, maximum adaptation volume. Is that there? Something like that, sure. Yeah. Um, do you just want to chat a little bit, a little bit about that, um, in, and explain what the different types of volumes are and how that has an effect on on training? Totally, super. So uh, they're, they're called the volume landmarks. That's what we call them anyway, because they're landmarks to sort of guide you on your journey of, of weight training. And they can actually apply to every sport. We have a book uh, out called How Much Should I Train? And it's uh, really just described this for every sport in a deep theoretical way. So uh, the first most pertinent uh, one is the easiest to understand. Probably it's, it's called minimum effective volume. It's the least amount of training you need to do to actually get better. Like, because, uh, you know, nobody believes that, you know, for beginners, minimum effective volume is like one set per week. <laughs> right? They'll get something out of that. Yeah. Nobody really believes that if you take a professional bodybuilder and you say, okay, let's train them for three sets a week, you know, like it's probably not going to work. You know, that's under the minimum effective volume. There's, there's going to be a level of training you need to do that it's just anything lower is not going to be enough. So minimum effective volume is something you should probably know about your own training or roughly have an idea of what it is for your various body parts. And then, uh, so there's that establishes this boundary. This next boundary or rather from here to here is your maximum recoverable volume. That's the most amount of volume you can train with and still recover to come back and overload next time. So by definition, overload is what powers training because if you're not getting better in training, you're not getting stimulating anything to get better, especially long term. So your maximum recovery volume, once you hit it, uh, doing any more because you can't recover is by definition a bad idea. In addition to that, your body prioritizes um, basically, uh, it, it will say, okay, if I'm really damaged, uh, then I'm just going to heal this damage, and I don't have enough resources to actually even have adaptation occur. And there's at least one really good study and multiple other you know, lead inference to the idea that if you train way too much in one session or in one week, you just, just recover. And sometimes you could not even recover. It takes longer. But just recovering is not why we come to train. So if you train all the time at your maximum recoverable volume, you basically just stay the same except you're training a shitload, <laughs> yeah. right? Which is really bad because you're getting all the bad stuff and none of the good stuff. So, uh, you know, all training to get you better should be between your minimum effective volume and your maximum recoverable volume. This zone is described as your maximum adaptive volume. 
Yeah. Like what your actual max is somewhere in there and you start a program, it's probably lower. As you apply overload, it gets higher and higher, which is why you have to follow it and apply overload. And then you hit your MRV and it doesn't go over that. And the last concept is the maintenance volume, which, you know, if your maximum recoverable is here, your minimum effective is here, all of training pretty much occurs here, or most of it. Right here somewhere is your maintenance volume. It's the amount of volume it takes just to keep your body the same way. Whatever characteristic you're maintaining as a maintenance volume. So, for example, if you're doing a program where you're squatting and deadlifting and you're trying to uh, increase your squat and deadlift, you're not prioritizing your bench for a couple of months, but you, want, you, know, you don't want your bench to go down. So if you find your uh, MV, your maintenance volume for your bench, maybe it's six sets of bench press per week or chest work or shoulder work or whatever, then six sets per week basically keeps your bench press the same. It's not enough to make it any bigger, but it's not enough. It's not so little that it decays in ability. So all you do is you set it to that number and you keep doing that number for multiple months while your squat and deadlift go up. So then your bench press is the same. It's always been good and now it's still good. Once your squat and deadlift have gone up, you can switch priorities and start training your bench normally between MEV and MRV, and then uh, you're good to go. Uh, you know, once you compete on the platform, you don't have to have this realization like, "Oh, my squat and deadlift are up, all oh, my bench sucks," because you knew about your maintenance volume and you addressed it uh, appropriately. And here's a cool thing: somebody might ask, "Well, why don't we just train our bench at minimum effective volume or between MEV and MRV?" Well, you know, uh, there's something called systemic fatigue where uh, the entire system takes fatigue and the more of your body you train, the more it hampers the growth rate of any one part of your body. So the way to bring up your squat and uh, deadlift the most is to actually do as little bench training as you can. Uh, because if you just do the normal amount of bench training, yeah, your squat and deadlift will improve, but not nearly as fast. And if your bench press is like a gifted lift for you, it'll just improve all the time. Your squat and deadlift will struggle and struggle and struggle. It's not a way to come to the power lifter. So in the end, what you really want to do is training at maintenance, finding, finding out what your maintenance volume is for bench in that example, and going all the way down to it. So here's your minimum effective volume. You definitely want, don't want to be between maintenance and minimum effective because then you will maintain, but at a purposelessly high level of fatigue, you still won't gain anything. So that's a dead zone we want to avoid. And then if you're training above your MEV, yeah, you're making progress on your bench, but you're costing so much fatigue to everything else. It's probably just better for you to find your maintenance volume which I will say is surprisingly very low for a lot of lifts, especially in powerlifting because the weights are so big. People think, man, if I don't do 10 sets of bench a week, I'll lose on my bench. Bullshit. You could probably do four to six sets of benching per week, a couple of accessory sets, and your bench will just will stay the same for the entire rest of your adult life, um, which is good to know because some people, you know, nobody wants to lose on their lifts. They want to gain on other ones while at least maintaining the lifts. And if you want to free up a lot of space for your squats and deadlifts to really, really get going, maybe you can move your bench down to maintenance volume or whatever other priorities. And the same thing works for body parts. You know, if you want a bigger chest, bigger back, you can reduce your arm training to maintenance so that you have more uh, ability, more volume to put into your chest and back without exceeding the maximum recoverable volume for your whole upper body. Yeah, I must admit, when having having read that and what I've used. Um, well, it did come about from a from an injury, but my deadlift dropped down, but then my squat and my bench both both shot up a little bit. Um, well, quite quite a lot actually. Uh, and I, I feel like why I asked to, for you to talk about that is because when I read it, it helped me um, explain to my clients about um, how best to how best to improve rather than just doing the same things all the time and staying in that staying in that maintenance there was a there was a guy that came in and i see him do the the same things and i know exactly when he comes in at a similar sort of time trains the exact same and it's been the same plates on the bar for x amount of time um, and i just i just chatted i just I, you know i went up to him spoke to him he ended up you know getting a um, doing a program with me and it was just sort of what are you getting out of this you're still coming to the gym, but you're just lifting the the same thing. You're doing the doing the same workouts. Um, why why not change it? Ended up the weights have started to increase a little bit. Oh, I didn't I didn't realize. You know, we could we could, we could change. We could do this. Um, and it's great to see. It's great to see that progress. I think there's nothing. What is it? The the definition of uh, madness is doing the same thing over and over again and yeah. you know, expecting expecting a different result. Uh, yeah. I like using that quote, you know, why would you keep doing the same thing and expecting, expecting the progress when really, you know, you're just staying, staying the exact same. Totally. And a lot of people would just, they'll have a paranoia about 
So one of the big misunderstandings of the volume landmarks, and a lot of popular movies actually reinforce this misunderstanding. You know, if you've ever seen any of the boxing films, like the Rocky films, yeah, yeah. you'll see Rocky training hard, 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 hardest competition. Yeah. Wow, that's how, that's how you make yeah. gains is training your hardest. And, you know, if you don't train your hardest, you lose your gains. And that's just really not true. Um, maintaining your gains is a lot easier than getting them. And people just think, okay, if I, like, it's, it's funny. I get this question a lot. Um, someone said, you know, I think I've been over my MRV too much for, let's say, my chest for the last several years. I've been training it with 30 to 40 sets per week. And I know that's too much because I just basically haven't added any musculature to my chest. And I want to go back down. I read your volume landmarks. I want to start with like 10 sets and start to work my way up. How much muscle am I going to lose when I go back to 10 sets? And I'm like, none. And they're like, what do you mean none? I'm like, you're not going to lose any muscle. And they're like, but how? If I was only maintaining with uh, you know, 30 to 40 sets, how am I going to not lose muscle? Well, it, remember I said that if you're training close to MRV, because the recovery demand is so great, you actually don't make any progress. So yeah. there's actually two ways you can maintain. You can maintain with a minimum work and you can maintain with maximum work. Yeah. This is just fucking rock stupid, you know? <laughs> so uh, if people like freak out, they're like, well, if I don't do at least 20 sets, I'm going to lose muscle. Like, dude, this is not like that. I've very rarely seen anyone with a maintenance volume of less than 10 sets per, per week. I'm oh, sorry, of more than 10 sets per week. Yeah. I, I, I can't think of anyone I've ever coached or heard about that has a maintenance volume in, in powerlifting or in bodybuilding of less than, can you, I mean, can you imagine someone's doing 12 sets of squats per week and their legs are shrinking? <laughs> Man, I, that's tough to think. That's three squat sessions, four sets, even if it's just, let's say, quads. They do four sets of squats on Monday, four sets of leg presses on Wednesday, and, you know, four sets of hack squats on Friday, and they're losing muscle, for, and they're not even on a diet. Man, that just doesn't, you know, losing strength, forget about it. Like, yeah. most, a lot of strong people, that's their MRV, you know? Yeah. So it's just one of these situations where uh, a lot of people just get really paranoid that their maintenance, they don't they sort of have never conceptualized, maybe, that maintenance volume is a thing. And if they do conceptualize it, they assume maintenance volume and minimum effective volume are the same number, and they're almost never the same number. For beginners, they are. In advanced, the more advanced you are, the higher your minimum effective, but your maintenance is still quite low. So there's a, there's a potential way to drop a lot of fatigue and get a lot going by really getting down to a low value. Yeah, I think, you know, when, like you said there, people get paranoid about, oh, I'm going to lose, I'm going to lose all my, all my gains, um, if you like. And it's a little bit, well, you know, sometimes as a, as a, as a general population client, Life might sometimes get in the way. You might have to change your training. You might have to drop it down a little bit. There might be a period of time where you can train really, really hard and make quite a lot of progress, but then something else, something else will come along. So I think using um, the, uh, the the amount of volume that you're doing, it doesn't have to be. You don't have to train like that all the time. You know, um, training's never. If everything was going straight up all the time. Awesome, but I think I'm, we might be out of a, a job pretty soon if, if everyone was progressing all the time. For sure. Everything does go up and down. And, you know, that's what I find interesting as a coach and what I like to, you know, put in place for um, programs because, you know, you need to plan out how, you know, how their, um, how their life is going to go and plan their training around there so you get the, the best result for, for them that fits around what they, what they can do. Totally, and sometimes even all the time, there's so much such a time constraint for most people that they can't actually prioritize everything at the same time. Like I remember people saying, like, "Hey, I want to train my whole body, and um, you know, I have like three days a week." And I'm like, "Are you a beginner?" They're like, "No, I'm intermediate." And I'm like, "Do you want to do three and a half hour workouts?" And they're like, "No." I'm like, okay, we're gonna have to put some of your your body on the back burner and some on the front burner. Prioritize some, deprioritize some, and a lot of people are like, "I don't." I want to grow everything. You're like, no, I understand that. It's just going to be like your lower body grows and your upper body stays the same and then your upper body grows and the lower body stays the same and then, you know, three months, three months, three months, three months versus like trying to do both at the same time and realizing you can't actually accumulate enough volume to get above minimum effective volume for either one of those. And that's like the huge tragedy is someone will do like, they'll say, let's say they have a minimum effective volume of 10 sets per week per body part, just as an example. And they have an option of, um, and let's say their, um, you know, maximum 
let's say their maintenance volume is four sets per week, right? Um, and what they can do is say, you know, if they train uh, with both body parts, let, let's say they're, they're capped at only being able to do um, 14 sets per week, 15 sets per week. Let's say. Um, it's just how much time they have. So what happens if they try to do both at the same time? Uh, well, you know, 15 and 15 divided by two, or 15 divided by two is seven and a half sets. So let's say seven or eight sets. If they train both, like let's say legs and upper body, seven or eight sets each, they literally don't even exceed their minimum effective volume. They're just doing a way excessive version of maintenance. But on the other hand, if they put legs on maintenance and put upper body into minimum effective volume, that's only 14 sets. That's one extra set that you need to get some gains. So in such a tightly constrained scenario, trying to train both things is literally a way to program zero gain, mm. whereas prioritizing one at a time is a way to program really good gains over time. Uh, and some people just, it never occurs to them that that's the case, which is totally fine. It's not very intuitive, but it, it's great when they find out about this stuff because it can really take them out of a rut. Um, and a lot of people just can't give up the fact that they're going to train everything hard. You, you say, okay, we're going to take your legs from seven sets a week and we're dropping before. And they're like, whoa, 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 I'm going to lose my legs. Like, yeah, but you're going to gain an upper body. You're never going to lose legs. They're just going to maintain. So uh, definitely a super pertinent for people with tight schedules that want improvement in a lot of places but can't accomplish it all at once. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's funny. I actually had a, I had a guy in this morning um, and, you know, a little bit of up, up, uh, up and down with training. And it was just one of those things like, look, he has a really busy, really, really busy job. What can you prioritize at the minute? What, what can you focus on? And let, let's, let's, work with, let's work with that. Um, you know, sometimes you do get throw, thrown a curveball of, right, well, actually, I'm going to be away for a couple of weeks. So I need to manage my training for that. Um, they only have, a, they only have a, um, a squat rack in their gym uh, where I'm at, but they don't have a bench. Right? Sweet. Let's do. We're doing. We're doing legs for the amount of time that you're away. Um, have they got some dumbbells? Yep. Yeah, right. Then we can still work, or you know, use that maintenance volume to keep uh, to keep on top of your upper body. Um, so when you were chatting there about um, you know prioritizing the certain things and uh, fatigue and recovery and that sort of stuff, obviously um, for the, some of the transformations that you put out there and the changes comp in body composition are absolutely awesome. Um, is there any uh, key or go-to guidelines that you usually uh, have with your with your clients? Because obviously we've mentioned about people coming in and might be a little bit paranoid that they're gonna um, if they try and do a, a, a body composition and you know drop a little bit of fat and get in a little bit of shape. Um, is there any guidelines that you use if they stick to this? You're not going to go too too far wrong, whether that's with training um, and things that they might do outside of the gym. The biggest one is adherence, um, especially with diet. You know, um, the problem with adherence to diet is that small perturbations in adherence can completely wipe out almost all of the effects of a diet. So, if you're on a fat loss diet and you're cutting 500 calories away each day, and then you, on one weekend a day, you eat a whole pizza by yourself, which plenty of people do, or you even just eat half a pizza on Saturday and a whole pizza on Sunday, or half a pizza on Sunday, you have just given yourself back 3,500 calories and have turned your fat loss to zero. Mm -hmm. Now let's look at how really bad that is you ate a regimented diet. You suffered in some sense for every single one of those days of the week except for one or two. So you could even say to yourself that your adherence score is like 85% or that's really good. That's a B in, in the school. You're a good student. Um, shouldn't you get good results? And the answer is physiology doesn't work like that. If you mess up your calories – enough to make it calorie balanced, you simply won't lose any weight and you won't lose any fat. So uh, I, I really try to make sure clients understand that sort of thing because if, I don't want them to get into a paradigm of, well, I was pretty good at my diet, but for some reason it's not working. Like, they tell you why it's not working. It's not rocket science. And the other thing about dieting 
is uh, measuring your body weight and looking at the mirror and stuff for progress to see if you're actually going in the direction you're supposed to be. Because some people do this thing where they don't know if they're cheating too much or even if they're not cheating at all, maybe just the diet has too many calories. And they basically like sort of fly blind and they're like, I think my diet's working. Why aren't you measuring yourself to adjust it if it's not working or to confirm that it is so that you know you're doing the right thing? So tracking is huge and adherence is huge. Yeah. Um, I'll tell you this, having just uh, the uh, RP Diet app is out and it's available for download in iTunes uh, Store and Google Play Store. Uh, there's, there's a, in the app that asks you if you've eaten the meals and you check yes or no and you, if you ate too much or ate too little. So it gives you a score of how adherent you are. And I'll, I'll tell people right now, I've told this to some people already, you know, you want that score as high as possible. Uh, and because if that score is lower and you don't get the results you want, you know exactly why you're not getting the results you want. Yeah. If that score is high or perfect or close, you're going to get some really good results. Um, and, and, you know, this is especially personal uh, to people who are personal trainers and all uh, that are listening that help people with their diets. You know, you can control pretty well what you do with a client in the gym, but the rest of their 23 hours of the day, gee, you know, who knows? And, of course, you can mention to them sleep is important and totally is and, you know, recuperation rest, low stress, but that adherence to the diet, boy, that's so big. So... That's my number one tip is that here's the diet. Number two is know at least your body weight to see if you're going in the right direction. Yeah, I think, you know, if you, um, the, what you've said there, if, you, if you're not tracking, then, you know, you're just, you're just guessing and you're just walking around in the dark not knowing, not knowing what's going on. Um, how I sort of, you know, if, you, if you're not writing your food down, why aren't you writing your food down? Oh, no, no, it'll, I, I've, been eat, I've been eating well. Well, why haven't we dropped fat? Why haven't we? Why well, that, that's exactly it. I mean, that, that's exactly it. So, you know, it's funny when the RP diet app, for example, and in the templates as well, there's no diet. There's not a diet tracker. You don't actually write down what you eat. It tells you what to eat. <laughs> so people are like, hey, can I write down what I eat? Like, yeah, if you want, but you should just be eating what it says. <laughs> yeah. You know, have you ever had clients that are like, write down all their food and a bunch of it's like cheat meals and they're like, I'm tracking. And you're like, yes, but you're not doing what I said. Like, <laughs> it's nice that you're saying that what you did, but you're just messing up all the time. There's no magic about tracking that makes your, your physiology doesn't know if you're tracking or not. Um, and, and so a lot of people will just go about it. There's just basically the easiest way I can sum this up. There's no way around actually following the plan. And, and a lot of times people just are like, well, I've been a pretty good. And it's like, look, if you think you could pull a fast one over on the human body, good luck. You probably can't. Right, it's not a grade. There's no professor to argue with in universities. So when I try, I mean, hey, it gives you an A instead of a B. There's none of that. You're not fooling anyone. Another really crazy one, real quick, is people say, you know, I've been, I want your help, or you know, come to a, a RP or many companies like it, and they'll say, I need your help. You know, I want to drop like five kilos or something. And we're like, okay, like you know, so um, you know, how how are you? Uh, you know, what's your diet history? And, and they're like, well, I've been dieting. For the last six months, and we're like, how much weight have you dropped? And they're like, I haven't dropped any. It's like, you can tell yourself you've been dieting, but you haven't been dieting. Yeah. And the thing is, you have, in a sense, because you've been restricting yourself, you've been at least feeling guilty, which is like a shitload of just bad stuff for literally zero benefit. But if you attract your, you know, they say like, or, or sometimes even worse, we say, well, have you lost any weight? And they're like, I'm not sure. Oh my God. <laughs> You know, know what you're eating, stick to the plan, track to see if you are losing weight or gaining weight or maintaining, and then make the changes in your diet, lower the calories, fats, and carbs uh, in order to, to keep on the right track, finish your diet, finish your short-term goal, take a nice long break of maintenance, let your body recuperate in depth, and then get to your next goal. It's really just about that simple. Yeah, that's why, you know, I, I can sort of hear um, – uh, what you've said, what I say to, to my clients, I feel like, um, yeah, after listening to the, um, you know, the content that you've out there and read what you've put, I feel like, um, yeah, I'm just uh, reiterating what, what, you're, what you're saying. And it's, 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 sometimes it's a case of, sometimes people think it comes across as uh, a, little bit, a little bit blunt, but it's a little bit like, look, this is the plan. 
you're all grown adults. You either do it or you don't. You either stick to it 100% or you're honest and just say, look, I can't stick to it 100%. I'm going to stay say 80%. Okay, so let's manage your goals then. Let's be a little bit more realistic of, of what you're going to do. We run a, a, a transformation project at Primal, the, the gym I work at, and uh, they get given a, a cookbook and a nutrition manual of why we're asking them to eat like that. Okay, for the, for the first month, eat out of the cookbook. Can I have this? Is it in the cookbook? No. Don't nice. eat then. Yeah. Have, you know, eat, eat out of the cookbook. And the people that follow that plan, the results speak for themselves. The people that maybe steer, steer away from the plan, you know, yes, they might, might see a little bit of progress, but then they're looking over to the people that have followed the plan being, well, why, why have they done it? And it's sort of, you know, it's not a case of they're better than you or, you know, they're, oh, they just did that because it's their body type. No, sure. it's just the, you know, it's just, just the plan that they've, the plan that they've put together. Yeah. Early on in RP's history, we tried to do some data analysis to see what kinds of variables about clients predicted how successful they would be in a fat loss plan. We had a bunch of anthropometry, body composition, dieting history, all that stuff. We noticed that everything was covered by noise except for one variable, which was degree of anality. And to put it another way, is how persistent and anal were people in getting the diet right. Yeah. Uh, some of my best clients ever were corporate lawyers because they literally just don't know how to make mistakes. That's been beaten out of them in law school and in practice. So uh, they're just like super precision oriented machines and they'll, you know, they'll, they'll look at their meals and it's like a little piece of chicken, little piece of broccoli and some eggs and that's it. And I'm like, whoa, living it up. And I'm like, they're like, why would I live it up? I'm, I'm doing this for a purpose. And I'm like, what's oh, shit. And they lose kilos and kilos and kilos and kilos. They get to their goal and they're like, I did it. And they're like, I could have told you you were going to do it. And then, because we thought like, you know, some of these people didn't even have great genetics. They've been fat before, just did this diet like machines. Yeah. And other people had pretty good starting positions. Um, they had experience in fitness and they didn't get great results because they were always like, oh, I had to eat out and I had cupcakes and I had a birthday party. And all of a sudden everything goes to hell and they're just not getting great results. Um, it sounds crazy, but if you do the plan as closely as you can, you'll get the highest guarantee of results. It, it works like this and nearly every other it's like you know if you've got a um you bought one of those little containers of like self-made cookies you know like make them yourself and then you mix the batter and put in eggs and milk and that and if you if you deviate from that plan you're how are you you're not going to call betty crocker and bitch that her cookies taste like shit they're like well, did you put any shit into it like yeah i used some of my own feces but i thought it would be a good recipe yeah. You know, how do you know how the cookie is really supposed to taste? You can do exactly what the recipe says. Now, if you're a great chef, you can modify it and get even better results, which is like if you're a fitness professional like yourself, you could do, if it fits your macros, you can do adjustments on the fly. You can go based on appearance and you can make an even better diet than just following the cookbook. But most of your clients can't do that. I sure as hell, you know, if I'm making cookies, there's no way I'm going to do anything other than what I can barely do what the box says. Um, that's actually a joke. I can't do what the box says, so I don't even bother with that shit. I'll just fuck it up. So it's one of those things like, you know, if you really want to look, see the, you know, the cookie picture on the front, you're like, oh, that looks great. If you want the closest thing possible to that, you do what the fucking box says. You don't go crazy. And, and, and some people are like, but I have all these different circumstances. I need to deviate. It's like saying, you know, I don't have milk, but I have like water. Is that good enough? Like, you know, you'll make something, but it probably won't be a cookie. Yeah. yeah. Do you know what? It's, it's interesting. You mentioned that about um, about lawyers because uh, it just it, it just came to came to mind. And um, every time uh, the the most success uh, I've had with clients is um, guys and women that are sort of um, numbers guys and girls. Mm -hmm. They like seeing mm -hmm. the stats, and once they know what the stats is and they know what they have to have to aim for. They just stick to the plan because they they love recording. And you're looking at looking at the numbers. So engineers, like, people like that, do really well. Yeah, interesting. Um, so for um, you, I, obviously I mentioned I come uh, competing powerlifting my, myself, um, and gone through phases of you know dropping down a weight class, gone up a weight class, um, and when you mentioned as well about yourself and um, doing bodybuilding, but also doing uh, jujitsu and and wrestling when you are going through um, training for uh, hypertrophy and having uh, a change in body composition how do you manage maintaining that level of strength 
is there a time where you would say, um, let's keep that strength the same or would you expect a drop in that strength? Or how would you manage that if someone came to, if they were a powerlifter or a strong man or if they were, you know, competing in a, in a, in a sport? The first, it always starts with your, the degree of the reasonableness of, of your goals. So if your goal is to drop 25 kilos in three months and still be a strong, you can fuck right off because it's not going to happen. If your goal is to drop seven kilos in three months and to be just as strong, and let's say you weigh 130 kilos and you're a strong man, yeah, it's probably pretty reasonable. So you have to decide what rate of losses is not excessive. For strength athletes, I'd say half a percent per week is the fastest I'd go. For physique athletes, similar. For people just wanting to lose weight that are uh, not super highly well-trained or just for short time periods can go as fast as 1% body weight per week. But if you're going faster than 1% per week, you're asking for strength loss for sure. Yeah. Yeah. From that, you know, having seen um, people doing, uh, trying to drop weight classes and uh, or dropping down the food so much, but still saying, I'm going to go for a, um, a PB on, on bench or whatever it may be. Um, just wanted to, wanted to see what your, your thought was on it. Um, because, yeah, sometimes you see people do it and it's, it go. It can go too wrong. I think um, sometimes. Oh yeah. So I think a good policy is to expect. Still try your best in training, but expect your strength to be at best stable. I and mean, you might be pleasantly surprised during a cut. If your strength drops a little bit towards the end of a cut, I think that's okay because a lot of that's just a glycogen depletion and accumulated fatigue. Right after the cut, it will come back right right back to normal. But if your strength is dropping starting in like the middle or beginning of a cut and it progressively drops every week, not just like a little dip in the last two weeks, you're losing muscle almost certainly. And that's going to take months to get back. So uh, definitely that is, you're probably going too fast and you're not getting enough sleep. Uh, you might be training with too much volume and like not be training with enough. So below uh, maintenance volume or above maximum recoverable uh, and uh, potentially you need to take more your, your diet more seriously or really hone in and then you'll get pretty good results so again comes back to tracking and detection like if you're losing your strength and you're losing weight really fast you know where to start yeah i think that sort of came back sort of full full circle if you like like, like what we were chatting the very first question i asked about how would you spread out your your training week you know let's think about what other things you're doing are you training are you training too much um for everyone uh, listening, what would be, after everything we've chatted about, I know sometimes sometimes when I have these chats, I sometimes forget I'm doing a podcast and I sit there and listen. I feel like I should be, I should be taking notes myself. Um, what would be your take-home points or words, the words of wisdom for everyone listening? Totally. Make as many enemies as you can in life because if you're not making enemies, you know you're not successful. I'm just kidding. <laughs> That's Instagram quote like if you don't have haters you're not successful like yeah or you're an asshole <laughs> um, so uh, I would say take home points of this learn the principles as much as you can if you really want to take control of your own training once you've learned the principles use your experience accumulate experience and applying them to see what's best for you and for your clients and lastly track monitor and be reasonable about your expectations measure and change things accordingly don't program hop for no reason if something's going pretty well just change it a little bit here and there to see what happens uh if something's going pretty wrong you're going to have to make some big changes so don't just don't like you know if you're if you're really lifting super well don't change a lot of huge stuff because you'll probably just disturb the system and on the other hand if you're just uh got a policy that just doesn't work doesn't work doesn't work like you said you know, madness is when you do the same thing over and over and expect different results. That, you know, when you're really just hitting the wall over and over, it's probably something you're going to have to change. Uh, a quick example is people will do like eight-week fat loss diets at one and a half percent per week and, and just lose strength in each one of them and have to gain it back. And they repeat it and they'll, they'll be like, man, this time I'm going to try to do like this little bit differently and I probably won't lose strength. Hopefully I won't lose strength. That's like, dude, your number one problem is your weight loss rate. Just solve that and you won't have any more problems. And sometimes people just really stick to their guns when they shouldn't or don't stick to their guns enough when something's working and do the program hopping thing where they think, ooh, if I just totally change everything, maybe I'll get double the results. It's like you're getting good results already. Just change things a little bit and see if there's a directionality to it. Yeah. Um, 
Absolutely awesome. Um, really good point, point summing up. Uh, I really enjoyed the chat. Um, yeah, a lot of things that, um, from what I've read before, have explained a little bit better to me. Um, let me know that I'm not going too far wrong in some of the in some of the things that I'm that in some of the things that I'm doing. Um, I hope everyone else uh, enjoyed listening to uh, Mike as much as I did. For people listening who might want to look at the content that yourself um, or RP are putting out there, or want to get involved in coaching with RP and looking at the app, um, or get involved in the books that you've that put out there. Where can people find find you and get in contact with you? Totally. So um, for myself, it's uh, for RP. It's going to be at RP Strength on Instagram or Renaissance Periodization on Facebook. For myself, it's um, at RP D R M I K E on um, Instagram, and then Mike Isertel on Facebook. Both are public accounts. You can follow me and stuff. Um, do not Instagram message or DM me because I don't check DMs uh, almost ever. Um, I just, I don't respond to people named like dildo lover 43. Like, I don't even know if you're a fucking person or a robot. So hit me up on Facebook. I'll answer your questions. But, um, so there's that at Renaissance uh, You can just start writing Renaissance or type in RP fitness. It'll come up in the Google search. So bother with trying to learn how to spell that shit. And then, uh, the apps are available. It's called, the app is called RP diet, just RP diet. And that's it. Um, and that's available on the, uh, iTunes store and the Google play store. And if you have a Windows phone, sorry, you shouldn't have a Windows phone. Nobody <laughs> has those anymore. <laughs> so that's it. Uh, awesome. Um, definitely check out the informa information that RP put out there. Um, it's helped me not just as um, uh, you know, a lifter my, myself, but um, as, a, as a coach as well. So thanks very much, uh, Mike, for taking the time um, to, to chat with me. Um, awesome. I hope you all enjoyed it as much as I did. Um, and... I will see you all next week. Thank you so much. Take care.